I'm Melissa Biggs Bradley, and I'm the CEO and founder of Indigare Travel, which is a travel planning company that includes curated content, a community of like-minded, passionate travelers, and a boutique travel agency. So we are really a one-stop shop for people who are inspired by travel and want to take trips themselves and need personalized planning around creating the journeys of their dreams, really. And it can be anything from a long weekend to a honeymoon to a family trip, but it really is about understanding how travel can help people transform their lives. How has COVID affected your industry, obviously quite a bit this past year, and how do you feel like travel will change post-COVID? How will things look different next year? In terms of how COVID has impacted the travel industry, it's not an exaggeration to say that it's been a catastrophe. Never in, in my lifetime has the world been shut down and have people been isolated and literally the planes have been grounded all over the world. So it has been really cataclysmic and, and many travel companies have gone out of business. There's projections that 50% of hotels may never reopen. There certainly will be many fewer options for flights around the world with routes being cut and, and many airlines going bankrupt or, or being massively disrupted. But I think I'm somebody who always looks for silver linings and, and I'm an optimist. So as difficult as this year has been for, for the company and, and we have had to lay people off, which has been heartbreaking because we have an amazing team. But I think it's forced everybody to really think more deeply about travel and not take it for granted in ways that maybe we had because it had become so easy and accessible. So my hope is that as we come out of this, there's gonna be a much more considered approach and a less consumptive one and that people will really take seriously the responsibility of being a traveler and the privileges, you know, but also the duties. And so I am hoping that some of the negative environmental impacts and impacts of over tourism will be gone forever. And that hopefully we'll come out of this as much more conscious travelers. That's beautiful. I think that's a beautiful observation and I hope for the same. What are you looking forward to most in your work and in travel post COVID? Is there a particular destination or something you're just excited to do that will be different post COVID? I'm leading a, a trip to Antarctica next fall, and that's an impact trip where a percentage of the trip goes back into sustainability and research and climate change. And I think it's really important actually to bring people to Antarctica and to understand what is happening around climate change. So I'm really excited about that trip. And I think that is in part people just being much more aware of our connection to the environment and our responsibility. But when the world locked down and nobody could travel, our mission is to inspire and empower people to change their lives through travel. We couldn't empower them at the moment, but we could keep inspiring them. And so we started a whole virtual travel program and we have global classrooms and global conversations with our top guides who we wanted to give some revenue to as well. So we have a huge network, which we thought would probably be just a temporary fix where you could go behind the scenes at Versailles or tour the pyramids with our top Egyptologists and take cooking classes with people in Puglia. And what we found is that people love what can be done virtually and it isn't going to go away. So we'll use that to continue to expand people's understanding of the world before they go on trips, connecting them to people that will teach them even before they're seeing certain destinations and then stay in touch with them afterwards. So I'm excited about how virtual content will enrich the in-person travel experience going forward. Yeah, it's, I mean, so true. When you prepare yourself before you travel, it enriches the experience so much. And by the way, Antarctica is my husband's number one travel destination. So <laughs> he might need to join us. Yeah, it's, it will be my last continent. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about 
um, exploring it, despite the cold weather and the Drake's passage. But in some ways, it's a perfect metaphor for what real travel should be. It, it you know, it involves some difficulty and anxiety, but in that hardship, in some ways, you learn the most about yourself. Yeah, so true. What do you think every woman should know before she starts her own business? You have to be obsessed to start a business. And if you aren't, you shouldn't, because there's so much that you don't know that you don't know. You have to be involved in all of the aspects from operational to financial to technical, as well as the creative, but also services. And if you really love what you do and you believe in why you're doing it, those things are things that you will take on. If you don't, it's going to be really hard to keep getting through the tough times. It sounds corny to say that having a mission and a, and a calling is essential, but you will be working around the clock and doing a lot of things that you don't want to do. And that's easy if you love the reason you're doing it. Yeah. How do you advocate for yourself? I think when you believe in what it is you're doing and why you're doing it, which again, my life was radically improved through the possibilities that were open to me through travel. And I think travel can shift and broaden people's perspectives and it can change people's lives in really meaningful ways. And because I truly believe that when I'm advocating for myself, I'm also advocating for others. And it's much easier for me to advocate for others than for myself. And so if those two things are combined, it becomes a very easy thing to do. What advice do you have for women who maybe want to travel, but might not have the resources or the confidence or you know, other reasons that they, they just aren't? I think travel, one of the great benefits of it is how it shifts your mindset and it forces you out of your comfort zone. It forces you to be willing to manage through what's unpredictable. And as much as we can send someone off with an itinerary that's perfectly planned, we can't control the weather. We can't control the moods of the people that they're traveling with. And a, a great traveler goes with the flow and makes the most of whatever happens. And, and I don't think that has to be a far journey to teach you that. I think you can go out with that mindset of I'm open to the world. I'm open to learning. I want to appreciate what's out there and see where I fit in and see how interacting with nature or other cultures or other people makes me a sort of a bigger and more expanded and more open person. And you can do that in your backyard. I mean, I, I really have had some of the most, you know, interesting experiences in my life in places that were very close to home, but it's in how you go out into the world. So I think there's taking that mindset and it's being willing to accept that you don't have control. I think you can have a travel experience without spending a lot of money if your approach is that you're curious and you're open and you're in seekers mode. Some of the most interesting experiences can happen really nearby. It's really deciding I'm going to be a seeker now. And I often will say to my kids, I think every one of us should do something each day that they've never done before. It's easy when you're traveling to take a mode of transportation in a foreign city that you've never taken before. But even in your own life, you can do something that you've never done before, whether it's trying a different recipe or reading a poem by someone that you've you know, never read before. And it's that seeker's mindset that you can get into. And if you take that out into the world, it becomes a practice. I love that. I love the seeker's mindset and the seeker mode. Travel is a mindset that you take yeah. with you wherever. Do you have a coach or a mentor or a guide in your life? And if you do, how have they shaped your life? I feel super fortunate. I've had a lot of coaches and guides throughout my life. And 
I think of them as angels who, and they're not always women, often they are, who show up in lots of different places and at different times. And I've had people ask me, how do you find a great coach or a guide? I think you have to be willing to look for them and you have to be willing to ask a lot of questions. And as somebody whose background is as a journalist and, and is probably a born traveler, I am curious. So I do ask a lot of questions and I'm not uncomfortable knowing that I don't know certain things and believing that some of the best ways to find answers is through asking a lot of questions. Literally, I was once on a hiking trail with a woman who turns out was one of the founders of SoulCycle. And I was talking about my business and asking about her business. And we had an incredible conversation because of lessons that I was struggling with that she'd already learned and people she could point me to who'd been helpful to her. I wasn't looking for a mentor that day, but I ended up finding someone who was incredibly valuable in a particular problem. But her journey was very parallel to mine earlier. And I've found that if you are someone who is open to getting advice, you will find lots of people who are willing to offer it. Yeah, again, it's that mindset and willingness to be open to it. What does it mean to you to be an empowered or modern woman? I think the hallmarks of an empowered or modern woman are feeling that you have agency and feeling that there are lots of approaches to how you live your life and how you spend your time. And there is no one answer for anybody in a very simple way. It all comes down to agency. It all comes down to believing that you have an ability to make change in your own life. And that's what I love about travel is it shows people that whether you choose to get on a plane or you choose to stay home or whether you choose to learn a language or walk into a museum, that's a choice. And every single one of those choices has amazing consequences if you decide to let them. I love that. Lastly, what is the best piece of personal finance advice you've ever received? I think the best personal finance advice was you have to measure what matters and you have to know what money you're making and what money you're spending. And the most important thing is to be very aware of what you're choosing to spend money on and how you're choosing to invest and what your long-term goals are. I think money is something that for a lot of people is loaded with lots of emotional baggage. And because of that, people aren't always as steely-eyed as they need to be, which is, it's pretty simple. It's supply and demand. It's what comes in and what goes out. And, and it, it can be very simple if you look at it really honestly. But I think there are a lot of people who exert magical thinking around finance and think that hope is a strategy. It's not. So it really boils down to understanding exactly what you have and what you need and where you want to grow and what sacrifices you're willing to make and what risks you're willing to take. But the starts with self-awareness. The single most important thing about finance, I think, is self-awareness and truly understanding what your goals and your investments and your risks and your risk profile and your needs are and being very honest about that. Yeah. It, it's all about, again, it's about your mindset. It's about being mindful of all of your choices and it all comes back to that. Well, Melissa, thank you so much for joining us and taking the time. We really appreciate having you here. Thank you. No, it was, you made it super easy, Natalie. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Bye. All right. Bye.